Hi, welcome to Viewpoint. My name is Lillian Newman, and Viewpoint's mission is to bring you programs on topics that affect us as families and in our communities. And my co-host is Susan, Susan Sal Salomon, <laughs> Executive Director of Drug Crisis in Our Backyard. Hi, Lily. How are you doing today? <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. And our guest today is Mike Piazza, Commissioner of Department of Mental Health and Social Services in Putnam County. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you for, for being uh, for being here today. Can you tell us, as Commissioner, what do you do and your job? And I know that's a big, 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 big area. <laughs> Well, in the area, in the, in the Department of Social Services, um, we take care of the most vulnerable population in the community, uh, people who are homeless, people mm -hmm. who um, need food stamps, elderly, people who require home health he heating assistance. We also are responsible for child protective services and, and child welfare services. Mm -hmm. In uh, the Department of Mental Health, we oversee the three areas of the mental hygiene uh, in the community, which is uh, the Office for People with uh, Developmental Disabilities, the Office for Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services, and the State Office of Mental Health. So people with developmental disabilities, mental health issues, and substance abuse and alcoholism issues, that's, that's our responsibility. Um, we do not provide direct services as the county, <coughs> so we monitor those mm -hmm, services. Mm -hmm. We ensure that they're available. We do annual planning documents to make sure to see where the needs are in the community because the reality is, and I'm sure that's why this program that's exists, it. the needs, the, the, the resources that are available do not often meet the needs. That's right. That's and, or do not always meet the needs and that the needs are great and at certain times they grow greater than at others. And you know, talking about meeting the needs, how are you finding as a county with the heroin epidemic? Um, how is that affecting? You know, it's a phenomenal <coughs> epidemic from my perspective. Mm -hmm. I came to the county in 1978 wow. as a substance abuse counselor. Um, I, was a, I was in the mental health department mm -hmm. as a substance abuse counselor, then as a, then as a um, <coughs> supervisor in substance abuse, and then director of alcohol and substance abuse services. And so this goes back to the late 70s mm -hmm. and the early 80s. And at that time, there have been a number of rollouts. There's o there have always been <coughs> drug epidemics, whether it was the PCP epidemic right. of 79. There was, there was uh, cocaine in 1982. Mm -hmm. um, there was then cocaine turned to crack. And in each successive drug epidemic, it always hit New York City first. Mm -hmm. And then over a short period of time, two to four months, mm -hmm. we always began to see some evidence right. of it being in Putnam County. But heroin was never a drug that made it up That's to Putnam right. County. In, the, in all the years that we had a, 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 that I had the practice with the Putnam County uh, uh, Substance Abuse Clinic, um, and as the director of alcohol and substance abuse services, the, the number, the amount the, of people who came for treatment for heroin or opiate, uh, actually no one for opiates, right. but for heroin addiction, was usually 1%, maybe 1%. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Today, 30% of the people that are in treatment in the outpatient programs right. are receiving treatment for heroin and other opiate uh, sure. dependencies. Um, and that is just from an outpatient clinic. That doesn't include the number of people who are in Arms Acres mm -hmm. in their outpatient program or St. Christopher's Inn uh, or the number of Westchester people that go to St. Vincent's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for, for uh, substance abuse treatment. So this is one epidemic that that when it when it hit uh, New York City, it, it didn't really hit New York City. It right. hit it you hit the suburbs first. first. That's right. The first place it hit was was high school kids right. and young people who were uh, addicted to painkillers and then turned to heroin. Right. It's turned substance abuse treatment really on its ear. It's completely different than anything we've been used to. Yeah. Now, I if I <coughs> recall back in about would you say 2003, the pill started to appear? Yes, yes. Okay. If, if you go back, the you can really trace the appearance in 1996 mm -hmm. when, um, when Vi Vicodin and other oxycontin or oxycodone type right. medications yeah. became available and doctors began prescribing it. And if you look at the graph of the number of prescriptions written for, uh, for, um, uh, for opiates, mm -hmm. um, the, the you know the the graph goes increasing in ninety from beginning in ninety six. Okay. And shortly thereafter, the hit rise of heroin begins to mirror the rise of um, of the uh, of the opiates. And so you're right. Two thousand three. Two thousand and three. I yeah. think, like in this area, from what I've 
heard from from uh, young adults, well, now probably they're in their 30s, that it hit, yes. that it was starting to show up in the high schools in 2003, 2000, and, or even before that, mm -hmm. like 2002, 2000. Mm -hmm. and uh, start to hit the streets right. then. And Mike, you know, if you look at a graph of the, the amount of money that was spent by Purdue Pharma in marketing uh, OxyContin, mm -hmm. they spent $120 million between 1996 and 2001, a five-year period, marketing that product to doctors. And they were eventually uh, found guilty of fraudulent advertising in 2007 and had to pay $634 million in restitution, which was right. not... Yeah, not not enough. Right. right. And those graphs that I was thinking of were exactly those mm -hmm. types of, you know, were the same graphs when Purdue Pharma began to you could um, see the rise. market. Right. And now, uh, as, a, uh, as an aside, um, I find it very ironic that when I turn on the news and I start watching uh, like the six o'clock news, uh, I use all of the advertisements are now for medications that help opiate Root. induced That's right. That's right. constipation. Mm -hmm. It's like you know, it's like they never miss a trick. The, the drug trick. companies That's don't right. miss a trick. But the 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 issue of the high school use mm -hmm. was the other phenomena that occurred. Okay. Uh, because in 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 those small percentages that used heroin in the past, they were usually older people. That's right. No one, no one was young. You no never one. saw a young person. That's right. It was marijuana. That's right. It Alcohol. was hallucinogens. You know, and occasionally, you know, if cocaine became, you know, if amphetamines or speed or cocaine became um, available, you might see some use of it. PCP certainly was a adolescent drug. It was a drug used by high school kids, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. never would right. anyone uh, use heroin. And and what occurred in 2003 and 2004, as you say, Susan is that we believe that you know uh, students are uh, that became addicted to painkillers and when when the painkillers were removed right. from the market they were right. unavailable right. they turned to heroin which right. was cheap and available mm -hmm. and it i remember the first time we heard that there had been a a drug bust a heroin bust in the high school it was just phenomenal That's right you know to think to think that things had changed that much yeah, so there was a heroin bust in one of our schools. In one of our schools. Uh, this goes back around that time that yeah. you were talking about. You know, genie's out of the bottle. Yes. People are addicted. People continue to become addicted through, uh, through uh, medications. Mm. And people be continue to use heroin. Yeah. At rates un un unparalleled, unparalleled before in history. Unparalleled. We, the other terrible thing tragedy that occurred that we also track you did not have drug overdoses right. uh, unintentional whether they were fatal or not fatal mm -hmm. anytime and beginning if you beginning in 2011 when we really began to track the fatal overdoses where there were 11 a year compared to zero mm -hmm. for many years um, and last year in 2015 we have 12 that have currently been been designated as unintentional fatal overdoses and almost all of them not all of them are due to heroin mm -hmm. but almost all of them have some type of opiate drug attached mm -hmm. to that overdose yeah isn't that unbelievable it is it, it, putnam county was a very different s suburb you know it's a very different area uh before this epidemic started so it's really been phenomenal so the unbelievable thing for us, or for me, is that we were going through this when my son was sick. Um, well, he was sick for about 10 years, and he died in 2012. So he mm -hmm. was from about 2002 mm -hmm. it started. He didn't start using opiates probably till about 2005 pills. And um, the unbelievable thing was that we didn't know anything about it, that it was, like, hidden. And mm -hmm. um, so um, I guess that's changing now. There are a lot more... People like us, uh, non um, nonprofit grassroots organizations, coming forward. People that have lost their kids really have That's right. all started organizations That's right. Right. to come yes. forward and bring awareness. Right. So one of the things we know is that Putnam County is um, a Haida. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's a high-intensity drug trafficking area. Could and the graphic, 
please? Thank you. Sorry, it'll explain right. as you're talking. Right. Thank right. you. And hopefully I said it right. You did. <laughs> you did. Come on. I Sorry. I, it is high intensity. <laughs> yeah, now i got to put my glass. High intensity drug trafficking area, which means that um, Putnam County is one of those counties that there has been a significant number of drug arrests made um, and enough drug drug utilization or drug usage to uh, to to say that it's it's on the um, it's in the area where additional funding should go for law enforcement mm -hmm. and for treatment uh, in order to uh, address this issue. One of the reasons, you know, one of the reasons that Putnam is considered a high density area, uh, and one of the reasons why a number of drug busts take place, is because of our position on Interstate 84 right. through the, you know, we've been we've been. We used to do counseling, you know. Now we're so much involved in in looking at other areas of uh, not just of uh, drug trafficking, but also human trafficking, mm -hmm. perhaps sexual trafficking. And we we in, in our community we happen to be a high density area in a number of areas because of Interstate 84 and 684. It is an easy way to transport mm -hmm. drugs from those areas where drugs are coming into the country. They come in through the New York market. Mm -hmm. um, there is a number of. Uh, um, drugs that transport between uh, Connecticut mm -hmm. and and Western New York, and Interstate 84 is one of the uh, traffic areas. So there's a, there's drug busts that occur as a result of that. So the high intensity drug area uh, is is um, we're designated so that there can be more funding put towards law enforcement to help address that issue. And we were talking as we were talking mm -hmm. just before the show the, this afternoon, President Obama released. One point million dollar, one point one billion dollar budget, billion. Mm. and some of that funding is to go for treatment Good. for drug, high drug trafficking areas, uh, high high drug use areas, um, and some of that um, is to go for medical assisted treatment, which we can talk about when you know uh, later on if you want. But um, how uh, well? How do you think they're going? How are they going to use mm -hmm. that money for? Treatment. Med medical med med medication assisted treatment. Well, I think it's it's to it's to allow more clinics to open up or more clinics that are available. Up until now, many of the outpatient clinics only did outpatient treatment and did not do medically assisted right. treatment. So, uh, in Putnam County, Putnam Family and Community Services uh, never did drug treatment. They are now providing Suboxone to a number of people mm -hmm. in the community. And Suboxone is, uh, is, as you know, a drug that helps inhibit mm -hmm. the uh, desire to use right. and really helps people in many cases who are trying to stop using, trying to seek recovery. It helps them achieve recovery right. from, from substance abuse. Um, Arms Acres is using Suboxone. Um, St. Christopher's Inn in mm -hmm. Putnam County mm -hmm. is using Suboxone. So, so Suboxone and Vivitrol is another drug mm -hmm. yes. which is also being used much more uh, now to help people, to help them uh, achieve a, a better chance of sobriety and abstinence and recovery. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I'm sorry. Um, so you think they'll open more clinics? Is that what you, is that like when you say they'll, see one of the problems is that, that uh, an Oasis was, I was in a conference with Oasis on this, which is uh, New York's, you know, it's mm -hmm. what the audience might know. It's uh, the regulatory agency for alcohol and substance abuse. Um, and they were talking about there's a big problem with getting doctors to want to be trained to give Suboxone. Suboxone right? Right. For one thing, they don't want to have people that are have been using or are using drugs in their waiting room right. with other patients. Right. So, so that's another issue. Like that comes into play when you right. say there'll be more clinics or there's more money for it. One of the problems is that doctors don't want to get involved in it. Right. And right. not only that, they they won't even take insurance. They they want cash. cash. If people come in and are treated for this uh, and given Suboxone, they want cash for that. Right. Well, the, and, and they have a right to ask for it. They you know it's their business really. Right. Will any of the money sorry address that? Um, because Vivitrol is expensive. Um, right. Suboxone. Will any of those funds be available? We don't know the details. Got it. Uh, but but I suspect oh. that that's what that's what that that means. Um, on the, on the expense of Vivitrol, I, you know, I just wanted to share that that was an issue that we took up in my role as DSS commissioner, mm -hmm. which is separate from my role as mental <laughs> health commissioner, but sometimes the two kind yeah. of merge together. Um, 
Vivitrol was a drug that Medicaid would have agreed to pay for, but a shot of Vivitrol was about a thousand dollars. Right, right. And Medicaid would pay for it. However, you the the facility had to administer the shot before they could claim, and it was a cash flow issue. And so we had an issue with that with the state, and now uh, that that's been cleared up, okay. so that the the programs for a person who's on Medicaid are able to give the shot and get billed for it at the same time without having to wait. So that, that was helpful. But to your point, which is I think a very important point, if doctors are not comfortable prescribing Suboxone, then, then clinics either won't open up or existing clinics will not be able to offer right. that service. So all I can say is that we now have, of the three licensed substance abuse mm -hmm. cl Oasis clinics uh, programs in the county, all three are offering that. Okay. So that's, and when we speak from the county gov local governmental unit, which is the unit that over, which is uh -huh. my position as director of community services as commission, as commissioner, um, we we are only talking about those programs that are licensed by right. Oasis that are governmental programs. Okay. You know, a, a private practice could open up right. and ask for right. Oasis approval. Right. Um, none has happened, and I'm not aware of any in Westchester, but none has happened in, no. in, in Putnam right now. But Arms, Arms Acres is private. Yes, is but I think of them as, because they accept Medicaid, right, that I think of them as, as not a, as, uh, they are private and they are for profit, but they also accept Medicaid. So they're open to anybody in the community. Oh, okay. I'm thinking of a more of a private proprietary that wouldn't accept Medicaid. I see. Only people with insurance. And the final thought on the on the clinics, yeah, um, is that in the past when we've talked about a methadone clinic opening mm -hmm. in Putnam County, yeah, there's a tremendous amount of community opposition. Mm -hmm. Why not? You know, so um, people what, have to become comfortable. Yeah, why do you think that is? There's always been a stigmatization of people with mental illness and people with substance abuse issues, and you know, uh, there was there was difficulty prior to Suboxone. People who wanted a medical assistance mm -hmm. treatment would be methadone. Right. Mm. In Putnam County, they would have to go to White Plains, to Portchester, or to Peekskill. And the White Plains Clinic is, I believe, closed, closed. down some Pe years ago. Portchester closed. And, and Peekskill closed, and now it's reopened. Right. That's right. But right. there were even problems. It was on the grounds of Peekskill, of um, Hudson uh, Valley Hospital okay. in Peekskill. And there were some issues with, you know, it doesn't give us. A, People feel it doesn't give us right. a good name. Right. So there's this stigmatization of people, um, the belief that treatment, uh, if you treat heroin addicts when they come, that they will bring crime with them. Instead of saying when a person is on in recovery right. and they're, they're getting their medication, they are working, mm -hmm. they are going to school, mm -hmm. they're doing everything that That's we right. want people to do That's is right. for recovery. Um, so part of our job is to try and uh, reassure people um, that treatment is good for the community and that the more treatment options we have the better. And you know we talk about treatment you know there's the 30-day inpatient and then they go to outpatient and uh -huh. we know that that's not long enough right. 30 days. Do you think with money coming in there might be programs that can have people stay for 90 days, uh, six months, a year on an outpatient basis instead of this get clean, get like some urines, 90 days, and you're right. done. Because the relapse and the recidivism rate. This particular epidemic has brought us to the point where a lot of our discussion with the state is if you want to see what your programs work, then they very rarely exist because they're all 21-day programs or 28-day programs. And, and outpatient treatment is is really you know can work, but it but it's it's much harder, especially when we talk to people who are in recovery from opiates. They they have been in places where for some reason or another they've been able to stay for months and months. Mm -hmm. And right now that system doesn't exist very often in the community. Um, St. Christopher's Inn, because by virtue of the shelter aspect, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where they're only billing for an outpatient mm -hmm. program can keep people in the program right. for months and months at right. a time. And when you talk to the people in recovery, when you talk to the residents of, of, of St. Christopher's mm -hmm. or the, 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 you know, the people in recovery, they say, when I ask them, what was it about this time? Because you know, I tried to get clean six times. That's right. Mm -hmm. I had many, re and relapse mm -hmm. is part of the right. 
relapse is part of, of the, the illness. Right. But we had, I've, I tried, what, ha what was it this time that kept you clean for so long? Because I was able to stay here That's in a safe right. location. That's right. So we've made that, you know, it, it where, where I'm taken care of in a way, right. I'm in a safe environment 24 hours That's a day. Right. That makes a so big difference. So we're looking for more halfway houses, mm -hmm. more, um, you know, where there's 24-hour supervision, mm -hmm. where people can, and we're hoping that some of this funding will go towards programs like that because we don't have a halfway house in Putnam no. County. How, what would a halfway house look like, Mike? It would look like any other house so that we would dispel the worries. Okay. Right. It would look like any other house, but it would be a community <coughs> residence in which everyone would have their own bedroom or two people in a bedroom. Um, two residents in a bedroom. It would be supervised 24 hours. There are different models in different rooms. One I'm familiar with is where different models and different rules. One I'm familiar with is that um, where for the first two weeks that you're there, you, you would come there, you would be clean and sober right. for a certain period of time before you get to the halfway house. Um, you would have to spend a couple of weeks in the halfway house without going out, right. except under supervision mm -hmm. to go to AA right. meetings or NA meetings. Okay, would, and they would be driven there? Mm -hmm. Yes, they would be okay. taken, they would be chaperoned. Chaperoned, and, okay. And, and brought back there. All right. Um, and then, after, then you begin to earn privileges, you know? Okay, and there'd be um, drug testing? Yes. Oh, yeah. So, so there would be someone on premises 24 7. Right. So right. now, search for change is, I, I know that is, um, it, that's a, a place where people could go and live, and right. they have different levels of care. Right. And um, is that sort of like, would it be that model? The, or? The community, they, have a, they have several levels. One is a community residence where people are there 24 mm -hmm. hours, and, and then there are treatment apartments and supported mm -hmm. apartments where people get case management right. services for support, and they continue treatment as well. After they've, sometimes it might be six months, might be nine months where they're in the community residence with 24 hour supervision. The difference with Search for Change is that they're under OMH guidelines yeah. as okay. opposed to the ha OASIS halfway house guidelines. So the, 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 there's much more freedom to come and go, you know, in a, in under OMH guidelines. There's much less restrictiveness than really what's required of a substance abuse setting. All right. So, um, I mean, one model we didn't talk about is the therapeutic communities, the mm -hmm. TCs. And then at one time, they were very, very mm -hmm. popular, and they, they've lost a lot of popularity. Um, but they are available for people for long-term stay for right. nine, to, 9 to 12 right. months. Well, when yeah. you lost that, you, Phoenix House, was that in Putnam? That was right on the border right. in, in right. uh, York. Is... There was access to... Um, there was access to uh, 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 TCs mm -hmm. in Sullivan County. Mm -hmm. You know, through Renaissance, day top Renaissance? and Renaissance, Renaissance? Yep. and, and are they all, Phoenix they're House. closed? No, no, but not that many. Not as many people go right. there as as used to. As Samaritan used to Village now is running um, Renaissance up in Ellenville. Right. Oh, okay. Now, so getting back to those, I'm very interested in those halfway houses because I think that they're really a critical. I believe that the community center and the halfway houses are critical steps for recovery for people right. suffering right. with addiction. Right. Because, and I agree with you, and the reason I agree is because w we were talking about heroin before. It was making me think about chemical dependency in general. Mm -hmm. Because the same issues of alcohol. Alcohol, for people with alcohol problems, they're addicted to alcohol. They have the same, it, it destroys their life, it destroys the families the same as heroin does, mm. the same as cocaine That's does, right. the same as every other drug. And the ability to recovery, people are wanting to recover. Yes. People do not want to be they don't. sick. They don't want right. to be That's right. um, uh, unable be to sober. take care of themselves. Right. And, and that sense of failure and humiliation mm -hmm. and shame right. that comes from each relapse just builds upon That's itself. Right. Our job in the chemical dependency field is to let people realize that it, it's one day at a time. Mm -hmm. you know, that's why it's so important to think of, I'm sober today. I can achieve anything as long as I'm sober today. The, the halfway house gives people a chance to be away from the drug to, and the clubhouses, a place for people to go to be normalized. That's right. To realize, and, and that's why people go to AA. That's right. And NA, that's why they're so up. successful. That's why you go with other people, you're with other people who support you in your right. recovery, and that's your best chance that's of right. recovery. Right. So and, I, and, yeah, and, and so, you're with other people like an AA, okay? Mm -hmm. But then you need to have somewhere else to go after that. Like, right. you, know, you need right. to have a life. And, right. and that's the problem. They feel like they don't have a life. So um, the sober houses, what, 
what will that take to get, uh, I mean, are they going to be bought privately and then they have to be, um, you know, uh, credentialed by Oasis? In, in many, you know, in the, many of the, so, some sober houses are not credentialed. Right. They're just not, they're just out there in the community. We don't have any in Putnam right. County that I'm aware of because uh, that would concern us because we don't know the level of supervision. But yes, a sober house would have to be credentialed, certified and licensed by Oasis. And I'm hoping that the additional funding will allow for entities that right. are willing to be able to do right. that. So l let me just ask you, I know we're going to run out of time, but what if you had a private organization that bought a house and wants to get credentialed? It would be, the, for the, the role of the County of Putnam would be able to help them to make that connection with the State Office of Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services in, and, and in order to meet the requirements of, that would be needed in order for that house to open. Is that, would that be hard to do? Uh, we haven't done it, but we would try. I mean, I, I don't know if it would be hard until we okay. tried. Okay, okay. Right, no, it we, is uh, possible. 30 years ago, we did try and, and have a um, halfway house for alcohol, an alcohol halfway house in Putnam County, and we ran into terrible community opposition, right. and we the couldn't do it. Right. And the funding just wasn't available to, right. to maintain it. Mm. Um, you know, we've had we've tried issues with shelter mm -hmm. for people who, you know, who, who may or may not have substance abuse right. issues, but who ha have no housing. Mm. We've run into community opposition for. Right. So, so um, I'd like to believe that we could do anything we set our mind to, you know, and Me especially too. in this in this area when there are when there is a entity, a, a group of people who have the desire to get something mm -hmm. done, you know, I think it can get done. So I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that will happen. And okay. Well, it's very interesting. It's interesting because uh, I think that is where we have to be in order to to be to move successful. Forward. That's right, and yes. to get people clean and sober for the long term. Right. And it was great. I want to thank you for being here. It was great having you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it very thank much. Thank you. And Thanks. thank you for joining us. See you next time.